Welcome to our program this evening. I'm delighted to see so many people come out on a November evening. I'm Danielle Moretti Langholz. I'm the curator of Native American Art, director of the American Indian Resource Center, and administrator for the Native Studies Program. And I want to welcome you this evening. But this is also Native American Heritage Month, and I'd like to introduce the president of the American Indian Students Association, Matthew Solomon, to read William & Mary's land acknowledgement. Matthew? William & Mary acknowledges the indigenous people who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Cherenhaka Nodawe, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansmund, Nodawe, Pamunkey, Patawomic, and Rappahannock tribes, and pay respect to their tribal members past and present. Thank you very much, Matthew. It's my honor now to introduce the director of the Muscarelli Museum of Art, David Brashear. David. Thank you, Danielle, and good evening and welcome to all of you. As you know, each semester we take a bit of a deep dive into an aspect of the art world through our Muscarelli Exploration Series, and this fall we have focused on the voice of the artist. We started out at the end of September with our good friend now, Roberto Humora, the Filipino-American artist from Richmond, and he spent two weeks here in residency. The print that he made during his residency will be unveiled in a virtual presentation on November 30th, and I hope you'll all join in for that very special evening. Well, tonight and tomorrow, we'll hear from our next artists in this sequence, Kara Romero and Diego Romero. Diego is an incredibly accomplished, multifaceted artist and a world-renowned ceramicist. He will speak tomorrow at Andrews Hall at 4 p.m., and I hope all of you will come out to hear him. I want to thank the Muscarelli Museum of Art Foundation for making the Romero's visit possible and enabling us to provide program enrichment to the Native Studies Program and MINER, the American Indian Resource Center, and the Department of Anthropology, and also back to all of those departments for helping to support the visit by the Romeros, and also the Negretto Sapner Endowment for Native Studies. So this evening, as you know, our speaker is Kara Romero. In the summer of 2019, I made a journey and visited a number of college art museum directors in New England. And while at Dartmouth, I discovered the work of Carol Romero, specifically her amazing multi-layered photograph entitled TV Indians. And I wanna tell you, I was captivated. And that was the start of the Muscarelli's Museum and our journey with Kara and now with Diego. Kara was born in California, grew up on the Chemehuevi Valley Indian Reservation. She majored in cultural anthropology at the University of Houston and later studied photography at both the Institute of American Indian Arts and at Oklahoma State. Early in her career, she was influenced by a photographer we all know very well, Edward Curtis, but she soon began to seek out a more authentic approach to her subjects and also began to experiment with the interweaving of imagery through various technological tools like Photoshop. Kara's work today is layered and intellectual and cultural and informative. She's won many awards at the Santa Fe Indian Market and the Heard Museum Guild Indian Fair over the years. Her work is in the collection of many art museums, and I'm really proud to say that her work is part of the Muscarelli Museum's collection as well. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Kara Romero to the Muscarelli Museum 
and also to William and Mary. Good evening, everyone. I am a language learner, so allow me to introduce myself in Shimwevi. Mike Quiz, hello. Hagaruyo, how are you? Nuk Havuntiam Siwava Ats. I am from Chimuevi Valley Indian Reservation. Nuk Kara Romero Niega. My name is Kara Nuk Nu. I'm Chimuevi. Nuk Gats Haut Nu Ampagawat. I don't speak Chimuevi very well. I wanted to say I'm so honored to be here today, but I have only learned to say I am happy. So Nu Un Sum Puru Nian. Nu Um Supro Ian. I'm so happy we are here together. Thank you so much to the Muscarelli and to William and Mary for having both myself and my husband be here with you in community. This week has been amazing, and I'm so happy to be able to be here and share my work with you. So my name is Kara Romero, and I'm a contemporary fine art photographer I was born to interracial parents in Los Angeles. My dad is Native American, my mom is Anglo, and in 1979, my whole family, mother, father, aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, relocated from the Los Angeles area to the Chimwevi Valley Indian Reservation, a very beautiful and rural place in the pristine heart of the Mojave Desert of California. Later in life, my parents split, and that split uh, le uh, lent itself to me being raised in a very biracial, bicultural setting. School years in the majority minority suburbs of Houston, Texas, and summers with my father's side of the family on the Chimwevi Valley Indian Reservation. These experiences inform my work and the intersections that appear in my work. One of the things that I learned very early on being off the reservation is that people from outside of our beautiful community really had no good grasp on what it was to be a modern Native American person. The incredible beauty, resilience, and diversity our communities um, reflect. And so I, uh, this went all the way through up to the university of level where I became an anthropology major desperately seeking to tell a modern story of Native people. I thought maybe I would write textbooks. I thought maybe I would be a professor of Native studies. And as fate would have it, I walked into my first black and white photography class in 1998. I had never picked up a camera, but had always been an artist. And there was a professor named Bill Thomas that changed my life. He emphasized content over technical ability. It took me a long time to catch up on the technical ability, but I had a lot to say. And he saw that I had a lot to say. And what I realized very early on is that a picture is worth a thousand words. And this was going to be my medium, my form of communication, that I would tell the incredible stories of the resilience, beauty, and modernity of Native peoples across the United States. So I did what 21-year-olds do, and I ran off to art school. <laughs> I ended up at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, where I studied black and white film, and everything was switching over to digital. So at that time, I embraced digital, and I went back to school for a technical degree. It was a degree of applied science in photography technology from Oklahoma State University. All of those intersections of fine art, commercial, analog, digital, biracial, urban, rural, set me at many intersections, which I believe inform the artwork that I make today. My community is known for its gender equity and women's leadership. Growing up, my grandmother was chairwoman of our tribe, which is uh, very common. We have a female-dominated government. All that to say, we're taught from a very young age the innate strength of women. It shows up in my work. We've always been taught to speak up, take up space. These are the beautiful women that made me the woman I am today. I wanted to share a little bit of the landscape that I'm from. It's so very different from the landscape we're, here, we're at today. 
Um, this is the Mojave Desert, the land of the Choyas, the land of the yucca trees. It's the second most biodiverse place in the, in the world behind the rainforest. So very vast, um, very small populations of humans, but very high in flora, fauna, and animal life. Chimuevis are historically known for basket weaving. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not forwarding on the right thing. I'm forwarding on my computer. These are the beautiful women <laughs> that made me into the women I am today. This is my beautiful grandmother on the right. These are the choyas and the landscape that I'm from. And these are the amazing Chimwevi baskets. We're known as the greatest of the basket weavers of the Great Basin. They're made from willow and devil's claw. So to pursue photography was um, definitely uh, something that was very different. Um, to be from a native community and uh, end up in art school pursuing a degree in photography. One of the things that I um, wanted to examine through my photography is this idea of time and space, of place, of our absence in media and education and our presence. And these very large ideas continue to inform myself and my work for how I approach the different themes that emerge. Certainly one of the themes that emerge are the idea of cultural landscape. The idea that we as indigenous people and all indigenous peoples, all peoples of the world are indigenous to a space and to a place. And that for the native people of North America and globally, our bones come from the cultural landscapes that we're from, that we're ontologically tied to these landscapes and that we're inseparable from the landscapes. I wanted to share a little bit about sense of humor and the landscape that I'm from. This one is called Jackrabbit and Cottontail. This is taken uh, on the California waterfront of the Colorado River, where I'm from. And uh, Jackrabbit and Cottontail are our mythological characters, our warrior twins that make the earth habitable for the first humans. This piece also examines the idea and difference in time, taking out the linear construct of time and entering into a space of indigeneity where all things exist in, at once. Um, this idea that things from the past, um, that the photos from my childhood um, that were colored like this one, um, come into our consciousness as native peoples that um, our indigeneity and our indigenousness exist uh, as strongly as they ever did in contemporary times. You'll see these four young boys from our reservation show up several times in my presentation this evening. It's Kiani in the front, his little brother Curtis climbing over the windshield, that's John hanging out the side of my dad's Cadillac, and that's his brother Winka in the back. A little sense of humor about our place, about where we're from, about how we dress as California native people. This one is called Sand and Stone, and was done in a very intimate uh, portrait setting um, with my niece, uh, the mother, to two of the boys in the last photo and speaks to that inseparableness from landscape. The intimate knowledge that we have of the different um, textures of the way that the washes look when the water runs over and the sand dries out, the roundness and the smoothness of the river rocks emerging from those places. It also speaks to our story of creator as a woman and how she makes Mother Earth from her body. This is another niece before sunrise in the Colorado River. Communicating again that inseparableness from our waterways and our landscape. The 
This one called For the Kawiya is set at a very special time of evening when the sun dips down below the mountains and when our ceremonies and songs begin. In Southern California and Southern Nevada, we are known for two types of singing, uh, both the salt songs and the bird songs. The bird songs are our social songs that begin at this time of evening and go well into the nighttime. This one is called Puha, the path. And this is an image of the same four young boys practicing their cultural perpetuation of the bird song. So we sing with these gourds that you see and they're in dance poses that you would see um, in these uh, cultural gatherings. Bird songs are open to the public. So that is a social, sh social song, uh, an appropriate um, song to share. The salt songs where we're from, it is not appropriate to share those. So in response to cultural landscape, we see indigenous peoples on the front lines um, facing uh, the effects of resource extraction, um, climate change uh, be affecting our communities in dis disproportionate ways. And so um, these ideas of environmental impacts uh, to our traditional ecological knowledge, as well as the importance of our traditional ecological knowledge, sometimes called indigenous science or ways of knowing, um, definitely show up in my work. This first series that I'd like to show you is called Water Memories. And the idea of water memories first came to me at the beginning of 2015 um, when I began to learn about the impacts of climate change to my friends up in the Alberta tar sands area, that their ice bridges had begun to melt and that they were no longer able to get out of their native communities. These stories began popping up across the United States of uh, indigenous peoples being flooded out of their ancestral homelands. And this idea of uh, a catastrophic dream of what it looks like when sea level rising kind of came to me at the same time and haunted my mind's eye. And I began to wonder, you know, what does this piece mean? As I began to pull apart the idea of water memories, it also began to remind me of the stories of being flooded out of our ancestral valley back at Lake Havasu in the name of hydroelectric energy. So across the United States, in order to rebuild the United States after the Great Depression, they created um, places like the Hoover Dam and dams all across the United States and declared the lands of native people eminent domain and flooded many, many tribes out of their ancestral homelands. Many people from my tribe were dragged by the Army Corps of Engineer with inches of water in their homesteads that now exist underneath Lake Havasu. It's definitely something um, that we think about as native peoples along the shorelines growing up in Lake Havasu is this sense of the haunting of the water and everything that lies underneath. So I knew I was gonna make this series and I began to gather stories and work with people from you know, my friends and my family and community that are thinking about the same ideas of climate change, of the great floods of the past, of the present, and of the future. And this series engages different participants that are friends and family that, like me, are experiencing the effects of flooding, of climate change, of the great floods of the past and the great floods of the present and the future. These two are from a pueblo that have been affected by the Las Conchas wildfires in New Mexico and now, experiencing, now experience flooding in their village in ways that they have never experienced before. When this piece was released, the element of water and the image itself, I think were so powerful that there was another layer of interpretation um, that I began to talk about in their free falling effect in this image gives this idea that their 
willingly going back to Mother Earth. And so it also speaks to this indigenous worldview of the blessing of water, of the blessing of life cycle, and our indigenous worldview that um, ultimately Mother Earth and these elements of water are far more, far more powerful than any uh, man-made control over the elements. This one uh, um, shows Chinupa Hanska Luger. Chinupa Hanska Luger, like my tribe, he's from two reservations, both Standing Rock um, um, that we know about from the Great Awakening that happened at the Standing Rock um, protest along the Cannonball River where they were trying to save their water. But Chinupa is also an enrolled member of the Mandan Hidatsa Arikara from Fort Berthold. This tribe north of Standing Rock was flooded out of their ancestral valley like ours to make Lake Sacagawea. They were placed up on a chunk of clay where they then found oil in the Bakken oil field. When I showed Chinupa this piece, I remember when he said, because I consult with people and make sure that they you know, like the stories that we're telling together, he said, yes, that's what we're drowning under is oil. And these two are mother and daughter. Um, this piece is called Eufaula Girls, um, coming from a place in Oklahoma, also uh, flooded out of their ancestral homelands. These two are Muskogee Creek, mother and daughter from Oklahoma. And this piece also speaks to um, this idea of why many times you see mothers on the front lines of environmental fights because truly we're protecting life unborn and this one speaks to the idea of the protection of environment in utero. In 2019, I had the opportunity to participate in the Desert X Biennial. The Desert X Biennial is a land art installation. They invite 25 international artists from, across, from around the world to participate um, in land-based art installations uh, in Coachella Valley uh, as a response to the landscape. In 2019, I was the first California, Southern California native person from the desert that had ever been invited as an artist to respond to our own landscape. So I took the opportunity um, to respond as an indigenous person would and um, in a community with the many tribes that are from Coachella Valley. The first one that I'd like to show is called Evolvers. This piece um, is photographed in front of a very iconic a uh, landscape in Palm Springs um, where the wind turbines and the development of wind turbines go on as far as the eye can see. Um, as a native person responding to the landscape, I knew that everybody would know this iconic landscape of Palm Springs. And from an indigenous perspective, I wanted everybody to take a cautionary pause and see that um, as uh, these boys represent both themselves from the reservation, they also rep represent time travelers that have come to respond to the landscape and the contemporary landscape of Palm Springs and Coachella Valley. That our indigenous spirit beings that we believe um, are all around us in the landscape would be quite terrified that this would look like a sci-fi movie poster, right? Um, and so they would run away from these giant beings in the landscape. All this to say, while it's very playful, it's also meant for people to stop and pause and think about the U.S. history's continual development of big energy in the backyard of people of color. While you might think that the Mojave Desert is a vast and empty landscape, it actually has a very rich indigenous history. And the indigenous people of the desert of California would tell you that the washes of the desert are not empty. They're actually the tide pools of the desert where the tortoise burrow in the edges of the hills, that they're migratory paths for um, endangered animals and species of the desert. Southern California and the Mojave Desert is under, one of, under threat of one of the biggest land grabs in US history for solar and renewable energy. 
If I had a moment to respond to landscape from an indigenous perspective, I took the opportunity to respond to the political landscape of the violent wall proposed at the southern border from indigenous perspective. Many of the tribes in the Southwest from both North and South of the colonial border have been migrating back and forth far before the advent of the United States of America. These four boys, like many tribes in the Southwest, have ancestry from both sides of the border. And so if our spirit beings were to come back and respond to the political landscape, they would advertise no wall on a big billboard. Coachella Valley is home to one of the largest migrant worker populations in the United States. And if you have the opportunity to take an advertising space and advertise anything you want, I thought I would advertise love. This one is called Indian Canyon and speaks to the idea of how we as indigenous people believe that there are still spirits in all of the landscapes, all of the people that came before us, our grandmothers, our grandparents, our parents, all that taught us the ways to live. While we don't have a word for God in Chimuevi, we have the word Ivan Kurur. It means those that sit beside us. And it's this idea that we're experiencing this life with all of our ancestors there around us all the time, still protecting these areas like sacred sites, watching things like development. I wonder if more people had these beliefs if they would be so quick to develop these pristine landscapes. This is what the billboards look like. And so you can see a little bit of what they look like. They were up for two and a half months, seen by over four million people from Palm Springs to Los Angeles on the Gene Autry Trail. So David talked a little bit about my original influence when I showed up at Indian Art School in Santa Fe. Um, photography was a, a lesser um, sought after medium for Native American students and at the time uh, I think a lot of us were emulating how and what Native American photography was defined as from outside of our own community. And Edward Curtis really defined um, the photography of Native American people. He created a body of work at the turn of the century that documented the vanishing race. They were beautiful black and white photographs uh, tinted with brown tones and sepia tones that captured the imagination of people from the United States and truly around the globe. The problem was that we never vanished, um, that there was a long continuum of beautiful life among Native American communities across the United States. And these images began to perpetuate stereotypes of what Native Americans look like how we lived and how we dressed. And so for a hundred years, many people in the United States without Native Americans telling their own stories thought that we still lived and looked like we did a hundred years ago. When I first came to school, a lot of us were making the same kind of photographic work. We were asking our friends and our family, hey, will you put on your regalia and maybe I'll go take your photograph in the middle of a landscape where there's no context of modern life. And after making a body of work like this, granted the work was absolutely beautiful, I thought either I'm boring or my ideas are boring. Um, and it really took, I think, a certain amount of maturity and breakthrough and authenticity to voice to say, we don't even do that. Like, why are we doing this, you know? And so for me, um, this, uh, I had a great aha moment in working um, in community on this piece that I did in 2013 called The Last Indian Market. And this piece, um, has become a very iconic image um, in my portfolio um, and it was so well received along with a couple of others um, that really uh, had this incredible intersection between pop culture and our indigeneity. And I wasn't sure at the time how they would be received. I have to say that my first audience is other Native people. 
I'm uh, having an authentic conversation with my own community about all of these ideas of representation, about our sense of humor. And I feel like when I am having the conversation first with my own community, it keeps me true to story and authentic in voice. And these were so well received. Um, I think that they were funny and I really had to break apart why they were so well received. And for me, it really came down to this idea of being the native person behind the camera. And when there's a non-native person behind the camera, there's really this instinct to want uh, insight into our cultural privacy. And Native American people are very culturally private because we've been persecuted for speaking our language and traditions and our ceremonies are really private. So all of these things, like even wearing regalia, are actually a very private thing. Um, when you look at magazines like National Geographic, um, photographs of indigenous peoples taken by non-native photographers, they're often seeking to gain insight into the cultural privacy of indigenous peoples. This piece, I believe, was so successful because it was really flipping around uh, the lens and saying, here we are, as indigenous as we ever were, and we're so modern, and we're experiencing Americana and pop culture right alongside you, and we study Western art, and we know biblical stories, and we have a fantastic sense of humor. Um, and so these images uh, continued on where I love placing um, contemporary Native peoples in contemporary context, um, using uh, amazing and wonderful color and contemporary lighting so that instantly you know that these Native peoples are from here and from now. This one is called Coyote Tales Number 1. And it was taken uh, in front of a bar and liquor store called Saints and Sinners at a very iconic location in northern New Mexico. Um, it has become um, one of my mo another one of my most iconic images. And I think it's just a little bit funny because I thought it was a failure when I first uh, did it. I thought, you know, nobody will understand this. Um, it's, you know, too far in my own imagination. Um, this one ended up in uh, National Geographic in the first issue that they ever um, had native photographers on native people, how avant-garde. It wasn't until December of 2018, I believe, that issue came out where they did an issue with all uh, native photographers. Um, this piece, uh, you know, speaks to our sense of humor, our pop culture, and Coyote shows up in this picture. Um, it speaks to our youth and painting the town red when we're young. Um, but Coyote, for California people and for many tribes across the United States, is our great trickster. He's our fabled character that shows up in cautionary tales when you know something bad's about to happen or people are going to be making mistakes. Um, Coyote always does the wrong thing, but we love him anyways. And so this people, this uh, particular photograph, um, you can kind of bring your own narrative to it and wonder what's going on in this fantastic night scene. They look like they know what they're getting into, huh? This piece is called TV Indians and was originally conceived of um, in thinking about the ruins in the New Mexico landscape and the incredible um, ruins of adobe bricks and the mission system that are all um, you know, falling down and lay in these fantastic geometric shapes across the landscape and thinking about our American consumerism and these ideas of our new ruins in the landscape. And so this idea of a ruin of box, box TVs that we don't use anymore was really um, where this photograph was conceived of. Um, so I had to talk uh, some, some friends in allowing me to go down to Albuquerque to the recycling center and bring 40 TVs and place them on their cliffside um, overlooking Galisteo Basin. That's what gives that great horizon line with um, nothing in the background is that it's on uh, a cliffside or a mountainside. Um, and then we turned on the TVs with a generator. These uh, represent uh, inner 
uh, Pueblo representation. That's my daughter on the left, Ka Fawell. You'll see her appear in my photograph. She was the girl on the right in Coyote Tales. This is our son, Santiago Romero, in the middle, um, and Dina DeVore. Uh, I use um, a, a repertory is what I would kind of describe it as. So a lot of my friends and family members showing up in my photographs as different characters, um, telling the stories together and, and kind of playing different characters. And then Diego and I really um, sat down and conceived of this idea of putting uh, ways that we've been depicted in Hollywood on the TVs. So everything is done in camera and then through the use of what I call photo illustration, the images are placed very lovingly on the TV. The ones that are showing static are what they look like turned on. Um, and the ones um, where the images are, are taken from ways that we've appeared in the media um, throughout the years. And it's a little bit even more nuanced because we chose images that while some of them are very problematic, um, they're also somewhat beloved in our own community. This idea of Billy Jack, there's problems when you go and rewatch those movies from the 70s, but I think that these were the only representations that we had. Um, this idea of Iron Eyes Cody, he's Italian American, he impersonated hundreds, you know, he impersonated Native Americans throughout the 70s and hundreds of films. Um, you know, he wasn't even Native American. Um, and then there's others uh, that appear in the photographs, the detonation of the atomic bomb, um, the occupation of Alcatraz, the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima, other nuanced beloved moments of the ways that we appeared um, in the media. I think that the stark contrast um, appears when you see how we've been portrayed in the media over the decades and how we look in contemporary life. And it speaks to this idea of kind of parallel worlds happening and existing at the same time. It's meant to be very surreal and very dreamlike. And so I invite you to go take a look at it. It's up at the museum right now. Danielle's done an incredible job deconstructing um, the imagery on the different TVs, and you can really get um, a great history lesson and insight through her installation that she's put together with some folks. So here, the same sense of humor. This was a continuation of my Desert X work with the same four boys from my reservation, obviously a reference to the Beatles on Abbey Road. This is the very rural road. It's called 17 Mile Road leading into our reservation. So as I mentioned, um, you know, something that comes up for me as an artist, I think so many artists bring their own autobiography. We write what we know best. We tell the stories that we know best. Is definitely decolonizing self-image through matriarchy. Um, I come from a matriarchal tribe with great gender equity, with women's leadership. We're taught to be strong. Our women are known to be the life givers of the tribe, to have a great amount of power, of ability. Um, and that's something that I don't see outside of my community as much as I wish that I did. I also think it's a very subtle but very powerful shift to have a woman on the other side of the camera, right? You can tell a lot about a person by what they take a picture of. And so I use my my maternal nature, my love of my community, and the, the, my love of the women in our community to empower and to uplift and to show the inherent strength of women and through that transforming their power and their self-image. This image is a recent image um, from June of 2021. This is our daughter, and she is donning uh, the regalia of California peoples made by celebrated, by celebrated regalia maker Leah Mata Frawa. Leah Mata Frawa knows all the traditional arts techniques of California, and she makes the regalia, the shells, the feathered dance belts, the grass skirts. She knows the paints to gather. She really has all of this incredible indigenous science knowledge against all odds, and she was working on a project to create uh, an indigenous dancewear, um, speaking to uh, the inherent bias and to the you know, residual racism that happens in the world of ballet and in the world of dance without casting women of color. 
Our daughter is uh, on point and an indigenous dancer at the New Mexico School of Arts. And Leah, I asked her, would you please make the dance wear for my daughter? Our daughter has been passed up for lead parts. Um, we don't say anything, um, but we know that there is some inherent and implicit bias going on because of the color of her skin. And so it was a very beautiful moment to place her in this all native dance wear. Her Russian skirt is made out of willow bark. Um, her corset is made with hundreds, maybe thousands of hand-sewn feathers. The sequence is made from hand-cut abalone. The straps are made from tule cordage. Um, her feather bundle of geese and her olivella shells. And we painted her uh, point shoes with red ochre. This piece, as soon as we brought it back to Santa Fe, made the cover of the Santa Fe Indian Market magazine. So it was a very special moment to see our daughter in the spotlight with our own community. This one is called Ka and uh, was featured in the Hearts of Our People show, the largest uh, native women's art show that came out of uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And this piece um, is of Ka Falwell. She shows up in my photographs, and this um, piece is very much a story about Ka, who is a contemporary clay potter and also speaks to the mythos of clay woman. She's the uh, deity of the clay that's uh, subtle and powerful, I'm uh, subtle and soft and found the world over. Yet when you go to fire her, no man or woman can ever master her. And I thought this was such a beautiful metaphor for the power of woman. And so uh, I asked Ka if she would participate in a storytelling about how the mythos of clay woman was passed down to her through thousands of years. We painted her body in white clay from my reservation and captured her hair at 1 8,000th of a second. A second photograph of a Mesa Verde vessel is overlaid on her skin. This one is called Nikki. Nikki is Dene, and this photograph is taken in front of an antique Navajo blanket, uh, really having a conversation with the earth tones, um, Mother Earth. And you'll see with these photographs, both the one before and this one, it really shows that inherent supernatural strength of women um, and come from a place of empowerment. The next series I'd like to share is called First American Girls um, and really comes from the perpetuation of stereotypical uh, Native American dress and of women found um, in dolls, uh, like the dolls that you find in truck stops. My husband um, and his mother before him um, collected dolls uh, and action figures. I guess they call Diego's action figures. Um, and so he has these incredible vintage G.I. Joe action figures and the love of detail and the historical accuracy. And the dolls that his mother had before him as an Anglo woman with the incredible accuracy and love and historic detail. When we began to look around to collect dolls for our daughter, there was really only one American girl doll and she was Ojibwe, which is very different from our tribe. And so I conceived of the first American girls. What if we had um, an incredible range of dolls that celebrated our incredible diversity from different tribes across the United States and each of the boxes was uh, designed um, with vernacular from the tribe's uh, different bioregions and used colors um, to show the incredible modernity and um, high, high fashion. And uh, so each of the women are from different tribes in this series. We've created a life-size doll box um, and we've placed their cultural accoutrement. So their items that they um, cherish and that they love. And these became very intergenerational endeavors between grandmother, mothers, daughters, and myself to design their different um, doll boxes, um, creating, uh, utilizing the different vernacular from the tribe. So this one has um, 
the pine cone design that you find in California on dance belts, um, you know, going back a hundred years and then on modern street couture as well. You can see that positive negative triangle design on the Bristol pine cones that are up on the pedestal in this particular box. So if you look closely at the pine cones, you can see that the tribe is celebrating the importance of the pine nut. Um, both in food and dress. The pine nuts appearing um, strung, uh, the brown strings around her neck. Um, Leah is the same regalia maker that made the dance wear for my daughter. This is her daughter in this particular one. Her name is Naomi. This one is Wakia. Um, this one is a uh, where the series started and is um, features Wakia, who's Kiowa and Comanche, and is wearing um, a traditional southern buckskin um, from the Plains tribe. So interesting that this one is also kind of uh, owning um, the Plains Indian, right? Because we see that um, portrayed often, but they don't even get that right. You know, we don't see that love or accuracy of the incredible artistry. Um, it took Wakia's family, five family members, and over a year to make her regalia. And so when you look at the Plains Indian representations and you look at the fringe and the pony beads, you can see how disappointing that is to be represented that way. This one is Julia and Jocelyn. Uh, they are our niece and her daughter, and they are from Cochiti, and this one has the Cochiti pottery design of beeweed around the box. Um, her grandmother's blue corn, great-grandpa's drum. The corn and the baskets from her grandmother's house. And so you can see how once these are filling up a room somewhere that they're gonna tell an incredible story about our diversity as native peoples and how all of our regalia emerges from our different landscapes and exists truly against all odds. This one is Julia in color. This one is Amber Morningstar. She is Choctaw from Mississippi and now Oklahoma. I wanted to do just a little bit of a sneak peek and I'm being really conscientious of the time. Um, this next year, I'm gonna be um, telling a story of that idea of presence and uh, absence in Americana. So taking different genres of film um, and of you know what's been going on in the media and movies for the last many, many decades where Native Americans have not had a role or if they ha have had a role, have often been cast as the um, antagonists of the story and never the protagonists. So I'll be telling a story, uh, I'll be telling many stories with ideas of like film noir, um, where we tell stories of uh, American psychological thrillers, right? Um, but what do psychological thrillers look like with Native Americans as the protagonist? What are some of the terrifying experiences that we've had in American history that have never been told? So really taking ownership of some of these narratives, I'm really excited about this series that's coming out. And finally this year, um, I worked with um, the Indian Collective. I was uh, commissioned to make a series of billboards in Southern California to bring visibility um, to Southern California intertribal peoples in the Los Angeles Metro doing another billboard takeover. Um, I worked for three months. Um, we relocated our family to the beaches or to the beach of California um, while I worked both um, very intimately with my family and with my best friend um, because we were living in a pandemic. And then as we emerged um, with our first vaccinations, began to work intimately within uh, the Los Angeles community with um, the descendants of the first people of LA called the Tongva or Gabrielino or Keech Nation, telling a story um, about uh, needing to have increased awareness and visibility for Southern California. California has one of the most brutal colonial histories in the United States. Um, and along the coast of California is, are what is known as the 18 unratified. 
There are 18 tribes along the coast of California from San Francisco to uh, Monterey to Los Angeles to San Diego, um, tribes that never received their federal recognition. I also wanted to tell a story of Los Angeles and of our many metropolitan areas um, as places that are holy. Uh, many of the largest cities in the United States were colonized and industrialized because they were rich in resources, because they had everything that you needed to live. And so I think we forget as modern peoples that these places were actually some of the most sacred and holy places in the United States before they were developed. So wanting to tell the story of California as a holy place. This pe uh, this photograph features uh, my daughter. Um, we went out day after day uh, on the oceanscape, um, photographing at sunset in a small family unit. So Diego and my niece and my other son are holding the light on these pieces, telling a story of uh, Los Angeles um, as a place of remembrance of our place of creation as Southern California First Peoples. This one speaks to the mythos of great ocean woman, um, the creator from our tribe. This one is Paso Robles. This next one um, speaks to the issue that I was talking about earlier of uh, the 18 unratified tribes um, being displaced and never federally recognized in areas that were rich in gold and oil. So while they had um, their uh, treaties to be ratified by the California senators in the late 1840s, they found gold and then they found oil in California. And so the tribes in these areas, richest with gold and oil, were displaced. Um, they still exist today, uh, have never received their federal recognition. So this piece is about um, the displacement of the first peoples of California in the name of oil and gold. And this is the final piece in my presentation this evening. This is with Shoyote. Um, she is a, from the Tongva Nation of Los Angeles, and we wanted to tell um, the story um, that she had with her family of being um, the first peoples of the Pacific of Los Angeles, of her grandfather being an abalone diver, of their regalia that they wear um, from their tribe um, their fishing nets, their fisher people. And so this was taken uh, underwater um, in Long Beach. Thank you so much. That's my presentation for this evening. Kara, thank you so much for sharing your story, your creative journey, and your amazing and growing body of work. We really are just, I think, collectively enthralled with everything you're doing. We do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, are there anybody in the audience? And I'll walk over with my microphone if you would like to ask a question. And we can bring the lights up a little okay. bit. That would be great. I really couldn't see any of you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Can you speak to the casino phenomenon um, that many tribes um, are involved with? And do you have positive and negative thoughts and works that you're doing with that? Sure. I mean, I'm not an expert on it, um, but I definitely have some experience. We were one of the first gaming tribes in Southern California on my reservation, and I can speak to um, some of the positivity and maybe some of the negativity with it. Um, I think, first of all, you have to look at reservations um, in some ways uh, 
we've called them throughout history open air concentration camps. So this is not the way that we lived and thrived and subsisted off the landscape and had interactions with each other. Um, we were unable um, to feed ourselves. Our reservations are often in food deserts and medical deserts and educational deserts. And so you really, you know, put tribes up against a wall when it comes to like, you know, asking, you know, certain questions like, well, why are they producing oil in Fort Berthold? And why are they producing coal in Crow Agency? And, you know, why are they, you know, doing this? And so casinos kind of come in um, you know, and this, uh, you know, this mode of survivance, right? How are we going to be able to survive and be um, self-sustaining and, you know, um, get off of, uh, you know, government assistance and all of these um, big thoughts? And then for a lot of tribes, you know, from Montana to Oklahoma to California, um, gambling goes back for centuries, right? Um, we have peon games in California. We have um, hand games in Oklahoma and up to Crow Agency. So there's this idea of gambling. And we had, you know, internal bingo halls and raffles. You know, even when I was a kid, these were some things that were going on uh, on the reservation. But you're speaking to the phenomenon of big gaming and big casinos. Well, tribes are sovereign nations and they have the right to self-determine. And the ways that they self-determine are ways that they're going to build their economies to be able to serve their people, to solve problems like being in food deserts, to solve problems like being in medical deserts. When we first started gaming in the late 80s, um, for our tribe, um, we put money aside um, to build some of the best and first infrastructure in our community that we've ever had, a community center, a gym, a clinic, a cultural center. So we're seeing like the positive impacts of economy in our community. Um, beyond that, um, they started dispersing uh, per capita checks. Ours are not a lot. Not everybody gets per capita checks. Just to give you an idea, we get about $1,500 to $2,500 every November, which makes for, you know, a wonderful um, Christmas or, you know, Thanksgiving time celebration or helps pay off some bills. But these are not life-changing sums of money. However, for our kids, that $2,500 goes into a trust fund that builds up every single year. And when they graduate, they get a lump sum of per capita money. This has uh, influenced the largest number of high school graduates that we've ever had. Our casino and gaming money also pays for higher education. So we're seeing more college attendees and graduates that we've ever had. We're being able to address all of these issues like food desert, medical deserts, and our communities. The negative sides are kind of twofold. One, you know, you definitely have an addictive behavior going on, right? This idea that, you know, gambling is, um, you know, addictive is a truth. And we do see the effects of our own community gambling in the casinos sometimes. And I think, you know, people from outside of the community have a gambling addiction. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. You know, we also have alcohol. We also have lots of other addiction problems in the United States. Um, and I would say from within the communities, I think the hardest thing that I've experienced growing up is um, this idea of disenrollment, right? And so, um, you know, gaining citizenship into the tribe, you know, it was uh, not popular in the 70s and 80s, but with gaming, um, you know, and the advent of gaming in our communities, everybody wanted an enrollment card. And so we really had to um, kind of stop um, citizenship and stop enrollment. And sometimes that pendulum even swung the other way where tribes were disenrolling people um, because, well, for various reasons, um, but one of them being they, the fewer tribal members there are, the higher your per capita checks are, right? And so though, I hope that that answered your question. All in all, I'm pro-gaming. Um, definitely pro-tribal sovereignty and self-determination. There are tribes um, that choose 
a, a different path. Um, Diego's tribe is one of them. Um, they see the negative effects of gaming and they have chosen um, instead to not um, include that in their business portfolio um, with kind of this mindset that this uh, will be better and healthier for the community in the long run. And there are a lot of other tribes that self-determine um, that uh, casino gaming um, is not sustainable into the future. So I say let the tribes decide. Yeah. Uh, thank you and good evening. Um, the Muscarelli Museum has your water memory picture and as, as, as I look at it, I get the importance of water, but as I also look at the two figures that are floating sinking in the water and the bubbles that are arising, I, I get the impression that they were uh, not just filled up with water, but uh, discarded. And so I'm not sure if that was part of your intent or if my interpretation is a little bit strong. Could you perhaps comment on that? So I really look at their poses as free falling um, and like really kind of giving in to the power of the water. And I think that that kind of comes with this idea of um, we as humans have already done what we're gonna do and the earth is gonna be here long after us. And so, you know, you have this idea of these catastrophic images, right? And they, you know, bring up these feelings of, you know, what are we gonna do? But again, kind of pulling in that indigenous worldview of, you know, we're gonna succumb to Mother Earth. Um, you know, she's gonna take care of herself. And so we, as indigenous beings of the Earth, are gonna go back to her. So that is really how I interpret um, they're free falling um, into the power of Mother Nature. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I wonder if I can ask a question about the group of 13 people in that table that you took, those family members. There are 12 people, and then you have the person in the center who is wearing the um, buffalo mask. Is this a Last Supper? Is this a commentary? on um, the, well, I don't know how it was in the Southwest, but if you look at the tradition of, of, um, of um, Native peoples in Canada where the Catholic Church came in and tried to change their cultures and basically Canadianize them or Americanize them, is there a commentary in that work that you gave? Because it's highly mannered. It reminds me of some Renaissance paintings where people are moving you have bread on the table, you have grapes on the table. It struck me as allegorically a commentary on, um, let's say, um, a traditional religion. Am I wrong? So I think you're both right. And um, I think that the sentiment behind the piece um, being called Last Indian Market, there were also um, some political issues going on in Santa Fe at the time. Um, really, the idea was conceived of, of uh, Buffalo Man um, is a performance artist and a very iconic performance artist in Santa Fe. His name is Marcus Ammerman. He is a master multimedia artist um, and has dressed up like Buffalo Man and shown up in native photographers' images probably throughout the last 20 or 30 years even um, as Buffalo Man. And Marcus, being a friend of ours, we sat down and we were like, we are gonna you know, uh, portray Buffalo Man in these really iconic images. So that was you know, the beginning of it. Um, in the image from left to right are uh, 13 artists. They're contemporary Native American artists in Santa Fe. Um, I think I can go back to it. I know the light's not as good as it once was. Um, 
but it was really about um, understanding, you know, here presenting this idea of, you know, having a great understanding of Western art, of Da Vinci's Last Supper, of biblical stories, and place kind of indigenizing um, those narratives. What do these narratives look like when we have presence, when we have place in modern and contemporary times? Um, a little bit of the political back scene in Santa Fe at the time, if you're familiar with SWAYA, it's the Southwest Association of Indian Arts, has um, the biggest Native American art show in the world the third weekend of August every year. And there have been many spin-off shows happening um, over the last, I would say, half decade, right? And so there's like this real tug and pull between um, this very like traditional show that's going into its 100th year and this idea of if these spin-off shows and these side shows are going to hurt the core being of our Indian art market. And so it became a very highly um, polarized political issue. Uh, and so there's kind of a little bit of pointed commentary calling it the last Indian market. It will never be the last Indian market. The Indian market's not going anywhere, but that was like a little bit of um, I guess the satire that's going on in this particular image. Um, it's not meant to be a direct commentary on the Catholic religion. However, in that new series, Americana, there is a lot of commentary on boarding schools and Catholic schools as um, they've interacted uh, with Native people in the United States. So there's more coming um, in, in response to some of those stories that we hold in narrative. I hope that answers your question. Thank you all for joining us. And one more time, please give Carol Romero a round of our support. Thank you.